with an umlaut over the O. So That's actually give him a big hand and welcome him in for his talk. Okay, hi. Um, so today, can you actually hear me? Okay. Um, so today I'm going to speak about System D. Um, I always prefer interactive talks over talks where I just talk and you listen. So um, you are very welcome and encouraged to interrupt me if you have questions. And I would much prefer you if we could lead um, this talk into the direction that you want it to, to go instead of just uh, me finding things that I can talk about because I can talk about it for hours. And um, I would always find it interesting, but it's, it's uh, the importance is that you find it interesting. So um, let's jump right in. So this um, is the first half sentence of uh, the description of what systemd is that I copied from the systemd uh, website. It's a, it's a long paragraph, and um, we'll try to parse what it actually um, says there. So the first part of it is kind of easy to understand. Um, that is, a system D is a system and session manager for Linux. I think everybody has a, has a bit of an idea what that could mean. System manager meaning something that manages the system, and session manager meaning something that manages login sessions. It is compatible with system V and LSB init scripts. I guess everybody has seen LSB and system V init scripts, like um, at least if you ever have administered the Linux system, you probably have come in co contact with them. It provides aggressive parallelization capabilities. It basically means that, yeah, it's very good at parallelizing Buddha. It uses socket and DBus activation. Well, what that means is uh, not so easy to understand, I guess, without a little bit of background. And uh, we hopefully will discuss this a little bit later, what that here pre precisely means. It offers on-demand starting of demons. I guess um, some of you might have an idea what that could mean. Um, it's actually pretty simple, but we start demons exactly the moment where we need them instead of already on Buddha. It keeps tracks of processes using Linux C groups. Um, if you know what a Linux C group is, you might actually understand that too. If you don't, then uh, let's hope that uh, we can also cover that. Uh, later on in the talk, it supports snapshotting and restoring of system state. Um, that's an interesting feature, and uh, probably if you have been doing databases or something similar, you probably, let's get rid of that. Um, uh, similar ideas of um, that you can actually save the system state and return later to it. It maintains mount and auto mount points. It, um, I think mount points, everybody knows what it is. An auto mount point is something similar, but um, the actual mounting of the mount point is delayed to the moment where it is accessed. It uh, implements an elaborate transactional dependency based service control logic. That's a half sentence that's really difficult to understand, I guess. Um, transactional, most people probably have heard in the context of databases. Um, dependency based, people probably have heard in the context of package managers. And service control logic um, basically means how to control the service. It's kind of difficult to understand, I guess, but uh, I hope we'll, we'll shed some light on this later on. It can work as drop in replacement for system V init. System V init is a classical system V um, implementation of, of init, init being the first process that is started by the kernel when the machine goes up. So this is the this is the really short description of what systemd is that is um, um, we put up on the website. And my talk in the following is prob is basically just trying to figure out what does that actually mean and and shed some light in on, on all the details about that. For those who weren't the last session there, it's quite all right to break in if you need to raise your hand. Get the microphone so that your question goes on the AV, and then hand your microphone back to me. Yeah, about the uh, LSB init scripts. Um, which distributions do you think? Because like on Debian or uh, at the start on the Ubuntu, are those the same? Every everybody basically uses them. Um, there are very the few the, distributions the who do not use System V. I think Gentoo uses something that is related to System V in its scripts, but is not. No, actually. I don't mean System V. Those have been there forever. I mean the LSB oh, LSB ones. and System V is basically use it synonymously. Um, system V introduced the concept, and then LSB standardized it and extended it a little bit, added a comment section to the top, defined what exit codes okay, um, should be done. Okay. So um, I, I tend to use it synonymously, and um, most people should probably do. I think all distributions which have adopted system V init scripts have also adopted LSB semantics to, the, to them. All right, thanks. Um, OK, so um, the first slide is um, about init 8. Let's 
Yeah. Init is the first process that is started when the system goes up. So um, the kernel boots, initializes everything, and then it forks off the first process. It has a PID1, and that is init. And systemd is one implementation of a process that could be run as process one. Process one is magic. Process one is magic in, in, in various different ways. For example, every process that is run on the system is a child of process one, if it's not a child of something else. Um, if, if a father of a process, this process dies, it becomes reassigned to process one. It also has some other magic things. If, if, if PID1 dies, the machine dies. The kernel oopses and then it's uh, end of story. If, uh, process, if you press Control alt delete then the kernel will inform process number one. And there are a couple of other things where pr um, process number one is special and has, has special powers over, there over uh, all of the system. It's basically the place where, where the system is, is maintained, the user space is maintained. So let's jump right into the features that system new offers you. Uh, one of the, of the amazing things that um, we did in systemd is provide parallelization in much more um, detail and in, in, to a much higher level than any previous solutions did on Linux. Um, so what does that actually mean? So we have these nice, nice, nice graphics here um, that hopefully um, help us to explain a little bit, um, understand a little bit uh, what parallelization means in the context of systemd and why it goes um, a couple of steps further than the previous solutions on Linux did. So um, let's have a look at traditional system V or LSB um, booting. Um, until Fedora 14, this is how, how Fedora booted. And at 15, since um, system D is being adopted, this will all change. But so we have, we have Avahi and Bluetooth. Avahi and Bluetooth, um, Bluetooth being the blue Z daemon, um, both need the, um, the Dbus daemon. So um, Avahi and Bluetooth need both to be started after Dbus. Dbus itself uses this lock. So it needs to be started after syslog. Avahi and Bluetooth also use syslog, so they also need um, to be run after syslog. So uh, to the effect that on, on Fedora 14, um, the activation, like the order in which these things are started is basically this one. Syslog first, Dbus then, then Avahi, then Bluetooth. Of course, there's no actual dependencies between Avahi and Bluetooth, um, but since um, the classic system V does not parallelize anything, everything is started linearly, and that basically means um, we just chose alphabetical order in this case and picked Avahi first and Bluetooth second. We could have done it the other way around too, but yeah. So um, then people looked at that and noticed, oh my god, Avahi and Bluetooth, we started one after the other. That will delay our boot. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could parallelize that? And they did the first step towards parallelization, and they came up with this. Um, SUSE implements it this way, Ubuntu implements it this way, a couple of the smaller distributions too. So what they did basically is Dbus still requires syslog, so we need to start Dbus after syslog. And Avahi and Bluetooth still require both Dbus and syslog, so they need to be started after those two services. But since there's no dependency between Avahi and Bluetooth, um, they are started at the same time. It's an improvement. I mean, the overall time from booting, which is like where the green thing up there is, to the point where everything is booted up is a little bit shorter, but um, there's not too much parallelization. In systemd, we go one step further. Now we suddenly start everything in parallel. And that is kind of impressive, because, because how can that be? If, if Avahi and Bluetooth use Dbus and Syslog, how can we actually manage um, to start them parallel? And that is one of the really interesting features we have. We actually didn't come up with that feature. It's actually something that Apple came up with in, in something called LaunchD, which they ship in, as a core part of, of, of Apple macOS, and which is actually quite a great um, engineering um, product. So um, what they basically did is they looked at what is it really that makes Avahi require Dbus? Why exactly is it that we need to start Dbus first and start Avahi second? Why can't we start this in, in parallel? And they looked at that, and then they found out it's, it basically depends on, on the, the times of sockets that uh, Avahi uses to communicate with Dbus are established by Dbus. And then they thought, okay, if it's just about the sockets, just about the fact that the Dbus socket has bound, uh, that the Dbus um, process has bound the socket called var run Dbus um, system socket, if it really just matters to delay the start of Avahi to this point, can we do something about it and maybe um, A, start Avahi in that very moment where this binding is actually complete and not wait any further until Dbus has done all its remaining uh, um, 
um, initialization. And B, maybe could we even move this binding of the socket out of the DBus daemon and do it in one step further, uh, one step earlier. And that is the, the implementation, um, that's the idea that, that LaunchD uses. It basically looks at all the daemons of the system, rips out all the socket binding from all of those daemons, and does it on the system level in LaunchD itself in one big step. So basically, if you, if you boot up a system with LaunchD, one of the first steps is that it does. It binds every single socket, every single communication socket there is on the system, be it the syslog socket, be it the diva socket, be it anything else, and then it goes on and in one big step starts every single parallel that is on the system there. So this is really interesting because suddenly you can parallelize everything. You only start processes in one tight inner loop and then everything just start, it starts and it will use the maximum of the CPU available and be at the um, quickest um, started up. It also has a couple of other advantages, because, because you can actually, because all the sockets are, are already there when, when, when the first user code actually is executed, when the first daemon code is executed, um, you get rid of any kind of, of explicit configuration of dependencies, because um, suddenly um, there's no need to, to, to tell the init system in any way that Avahi requires dbus. You don't have to tell um, the init system that Avahi requires syslog. Because what Avahi can do is, it can just access the socket. And if it's there, and it will be there, because it got initialized um, early in the beginning by the init system itself, it can connect to that. And uh, it also has a couple of other advantages. For example, Bluetooth is, is um, not actually needed in, in many of the cases, um, because um, I don't know, because you are in flight mode and, and have your Bluetooth hardware disabled, or you don't even have even Bluetooth or stuff like that. So you can actually also do, um, use this kind of socket activation, which is the name by, by which this all goes, to on-demand start services. You basically just install all the sockets, and instead of then going on and also starting all the diamonds at the same time, you just, you just don't do it. You just leave it out and don't start the diamonds. But the moment somebody actually connects to your socket, you then go, start the actual diamonds, and the client won't even notice. Because that is a really nice thing. As, as soon as all the sockets are established, all the clients can just go and connect to them. And, and the sockets will be there. And if there's nothing behind it because, because the daemon wasn't started yet, then the clients won't notice that. But the inner system will then start the services. It will take a little bit longer, but um, it's not visible to the client. Or if the, or if the providing service is still is still in the process of booting up, then, then it will delay until that is finished, but um, still it's not visible to the client. You have a question. Uh, and the... Yeah. So my question is, does that mean all the services need to be modified so that... They yeah. Be so the question was whether all the services need to be modified to make this work. The answer is yes and no. The answer is, in the general case, yes, um, um, because, because basically what you need to do is you, you need to look at the code that, that actually installs the sockets, which is basically calling the so socket system call, then calling the bind system call, and then calling the listen si system call. You usually would rip these three things out. Um, there's a very, very simple interface how systemd and those daemons can communicate to just, they get the sockets passed and they basically don't need to do anything. The code actually becomes um, much simpler if they do that. In that case, you would patch um, uh, the daemon. We did that, for example, for rsyslog. We did that for dbus. However, in some cases, you don't actually need to do patching. And the reason why you don't need to, need to do bad patching is that this idea is not completely new on Linux. Because um, there's the inetd. Um, uh, 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 Daemon has been a part of Unix since, since time began, basically, since 30 years ago. Einer D was, was one of those classic um, Daemons that were a part of uh, Linux, which basically, of Unix, uh, which basically started a, a, a service the moment the first connection came in, then spawned one instance for the connection of a, a specific service, for example, for SSHD, or, or back then probably more Telnet D than SSHD. But, um, so basically, you would end up with, with one instance per connection, and this is already there. So it, there's, there, there are two big differences between INET-D and this kind of socket activation. The first one, INET-D was almost always used in the way that you had one instance of this uh, service, of the daemon, 
per connection. And this is more designed so that when the first connection comes in, you actually hand over the, the real socket, the listening socket, instead of the connection socket, so that all further connections are handled by the daemon itself, so that you only have one daemon um, uh, for, for, for all of the sockets instead of uh, one daemon each for each uh, connection. And uh, the other thing that, that INAD um, did differently is that INAD was focused to only do stuff on demand. While we not only do things on demand, we can do that too, but it's actually not that interesting, we do it mostly to be able to parallelize stuff and, and start things in parallel. So, to coming back to your question, um, some diamonds you should be patching. You need to patch all of those basically where you want to wanna have one daemon dealing with all the connections. But other diamonds, like SSHD for example, you don't need to patch because they also already support INAD um, um, socket activation basically, and that works with systemd2. Also, um, MacOS um, has been using the same scheme since ages. Um, okay, ages like, I don't know, since MacOS 10.2 or something like that. Um, so, most of the code is already there. It's not compatible. Uh, you need to make minor modifications. But um, quite a bit of, of, the, of, the, of the Unix software that is established has support for LaunchD, and then it just takes a couple of changes to, to make that work with systemd as well. So if you have code which is proprietary, uh, you can't uh, retrofit it, and it was never written for use with INETD, uh, could you pre-wrapper it with LD preload or similar to uh, uh, make it work with systemd? Well, uh, we initially thought about, um, or actually we spent quite some time on, 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 instead of doing this in user space and patching all the applications, have somehow the kernel hand over the sockets for us. So basically that we would create the sockets, we would call them ghost sockets or something like that, and then when the actual daemon starts up, it would just, just take those already existing sockets and work on them so that the applications would not need to be patched. Um, we investigated it in much detail, but the, it's, it's not impossible to do, but it's actually really, really complex to do because, because sockets in these days have a gazillion of sock options. They can be members of, of multicast groups and stuff like that. So basically, you would, in the moment where the daemon starts up, suddenly exchange one socket by the other, and because um, at the time where the socket is created by the application, you don't really know what kind of socket is it going to be, to which port is it going to bind, you have this problem that in the moment where the where you actually bind in the application, you would need to find the right socket and then exchange those two or copy over all the socket options. It's, it's madness. It's doable. There's no doubt about that. But uh, we then thought it's okay, given that the, the, the applications are re uh, the the, the uh, damage are really easy to patch, um, we go with the patching. It's, it's, it's more intelligent anyway right now. Um, at this point in time, quite a few damage are actually patched. As mentioned, for example, Divas is patched, Syslog is patched, Avahi is patched. Uh, Bluetooth is not patched, but doesn't really need much patching. Um, there's even Dovecot, even IMAP servers are nowadays patched. Um, of course, not everything is patched. Um, there's still a lot of uh, stuff to go. But um, since since we announced systemd, actually quite a big um, amount of code has been patched. Um, do do you support uh, having a daemon sort of die if it's idle for a bit, or if it you know, core dumps or something, uh, will systemd notice the death and then restart on yes. demand? Or? That's actually one really amazing feature of the socket activation. Because um, syslog is now socket activated, so it's systemd um, which creates a socket and then listens on it and then eventually um, syslog starts up. Now if syslog crashes for some weird reason, I mean syslog nowadays tend to be really complex pieces of code, so they have every reason to crash. If they crash, then, then they will go away System, we will notice that. Um, if if the R syslog um, or whatever syslog um, service has been configured for it, it will automatically be restarted. Get the original socket again and will continue um, processing the, the incoming log messages from exactly the spot um, where, the, where, where it left off. Of course, minus the one message where syslog actually uh, uh, was crashing on. So you have suddenly a really robust system where you can take away syslog, you can just kill it, and you can, can, can put it back in, it will not notice, not a single message will be lost. And, and that makes it a really nice and robust system because suddenly, so you can even do restarting of, of daemons, you can do upgrading of daemons. Like you, you install, I don't know, your web server, then you upgrade your web server, you should shut the old one down, you, you start the new one. Because a socket listening is actually um, done by, by systemd and systemd will always retain a copy of the, a, a duplicate of this original socket. You can restart everything and, and it will just work and, and, and the user will not notice it and there will not be a single moment where it's visible to the user 
um, that, the, that the daemon went away and came back. Um, this all works for INET sockets, but the focus is definitely Unix sockets, which is also a big difference, by the way, to INET-D, because classic INET-D just, I mean, given already by the name, was focusing on internet sockets, not so much on AF Unix sockets. But, um, for example, in the syslog and the dbus case, the focus is clearly um, on AF Unix. So, yeah. Um, the, one of the nicest things about this is, is as I already mentioned, all this dependency configuration, that, that classic um, parallelization system like System V, the way Zuse was using it, Ubuntu uses it, um, classically you had to, 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 to declare all the ordering where you executed stuff. The nice thing is that, that um, for System D, the kernel will order the execution for us. Because um, if you look at it, for example, syslog. Um, in a classic way, when uh, you first have to wait until syslog is up, and then you start dbus because dbus uses syslog. In, this, in, the, in the design, when we use this completely parallelized stuff where the, where the socket is already established by the init system, then basically if, if Dbus wants to lock something at a point in time where, where syslog isn't up yet, it will just write that message to the, to the syslog socket. It will just be queued by the kernel. Um, it will just hang there and it doesn't really matter. And eventually when syslog then, then, then actually has caught up with execution, it will, it will go to the socket actually pull all the stuff that was buffered in there and process it, but this thing is completely asynchronous. The, the um, Dbus daemon has, never has to wait for it, except when this, this socket buffer actually runs over. And then it will freeze until this log has, has caught up. So the idea in this case is, is there's no need to, to, to order execution or anything anymore uh, from user space because the kernel will do it. The kernel will simply do it by, by making sure that a client which locks too much will eventually freeze until the socket buffer is cleared again from the other side. Of course, syslog is a very simple case in this case because, because um, syslog is one-way communication. The messages go from the applications, from the, from, from the daemons to the syslog daemons, but never in the other way around. If you, if you look at dbus, this is of course more complex because suddenly you have a two-way communication. When, when somebody connects to dbus, he needs to, to, to authenticate himself and, and stuff like that. So there's always a force back. But still, in this case, um, when you use, use this kind of, of complete parallelization uh, with socket activation, then, then uh, you wait exactly as much as you really need to do because, because you basically send your stuff to the socket and then only this thread of the daemon, if it's multi-thread, and, and really you need to wait just for the reply of this one thing and this one thing will wait exactly as long as necessary as long as the, as the, as the dbus daemon has used to start up. And yeah, anyway, it's a, it's a really nice design. Um, there's a question. The mic. Um, don't you run the risk of um, having it um, deadlock? Is there is there an increased risk of that or not? Well, uh, that's a, that's a not, uh, so. The question was um, whether whether there's a risk of uh, running into deadlocks. Um, well, there is the same amount of running a risk in, in, of running into deadlocks as there always is, because we don't really change anything. Um, you don't have to configure the dependencies anymore, but the, the dependencies in the end are still there. I mean, they're, they're just practically implemented. So, so if your current system doesn't have deadlocks, if your current system, if there's no dependency, for example, between this lock and dbus and dbus and this lock, um, then it won't have any in this scheme neither. But uh, if it has, then yeah. Basically, basically, this design has no influence whatsoever on, on the dependency system if, if there are cyclic dependency loops or something like that. If they had that before, which usually meant a deadlock, then they will have that with this scheme, uh, and it will still mean uh, some kind of deadlock. So does that kind of answer your question? OK. So um, this is. Yeah, this is, this is socket, activ uh, socket activation. Um, as mentioned, Nacos, um, the Apple engineers came up with that and implemented it in LaunchD. Um, LaunchD is actually really nice um, from all the ideas they implemented in that, and I think it's one of the most capable systems that existed. Um, however, I'm not sure if it's really the right thing to run on Linux. Also, it still doesn't use anything of the other stuff we can use in Linux. Um, how much time do I actually have? Where's my watch? 20 minutes. Okay. So, um, this was socket activation. Um, there's also bus-based activation, bus referring to, to dbus. Nowadays, on, on, on a Fedora default install, we actually install more dbus daemons than actually daemons that listen on sockets. 
um, because we install all this stuff like UDISCs and PolicyKit and whatever not. Um, and you can extend the same scheme that you did for the, uh, that we are no, now doing for the socket based activation, also for bus based activation. Meaning, you install the bus name, a bus service, much earlier um, before you actually start the service. This has been implemented in some way in DBus actually for, uh, for quite a while. Um, system bus activation um, has been around there, but in this case it was only focused on, on, on DBus being the only one who actually pro, uh, starts those services. Um, with systemd, we extend that. You can, you can actually activate a service, not only by socket activation, but also by bus activation and a couple of other ways of activation. For example, hardware activation, plugins, and stuff like that. But yeah, um, there is also um, the idea of on-demand loading. Meaning, um, Avahi, for example, um, is, um, I hope many people of you know that, it's a, it's a service discovery um, service uh, demo in the, uh, for the network. Um, it's kind of useful, but it's completely useless if you don't even have a network. So, um, systemd is designed to start services like this at the time they actually need it. Meaning, at the moment there is a network interface around, because then you wanted to announce your local host name and stuff like that on the, on the, on the local network, or when a local application uses this. And we can do that easy, easily, because we use hardware-based um, activation to, to start Avahi, in addition to DBus-based activation, meaning um, that when somebody asks via DBus, um, I want to browse for these services, um, that Avahi is started in that moment, or also via socket-based activation if somebody resolves a host name with, with NSS. So, um, yeah. Um, Just one quick question. Does that mean that... Does that mean that when uh, your hardware interface goes down, suppose I shut off my wireless, it will automatically kill Avahi? That's a very good question. Um, so in, in systemd, we, we were discussing these, these problems. Should we, should we automatically always reference count everything, every service we, we, we take up? And if the reason uh, why we, 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 we booted it up um, is not there anymore, should we shut it down again? Um, so basically, we can do that but we don't do it by default. The idea behind that is, is we want to minimize our work. So basically, we think that, that if Avahi is already started up, then it's probably, it probably makes more sense just to leave it there because it's probably going to be swapped out anyway and hangs in a, in a select loop, so it won't really eat that many resources. And, and it's really difficult actually figuring out when, when Avahi is really, really idle, when, when the, would be the right time to actually shut it down because Avahi would have to decide it itself. For example, if, if, if there's still somebody using one of the of the of the DBus interfaces of Avahi, then you probably want to delay that to the moment where um, yeah. he doesn't use that anymore. So yeah, we, we do support it. You can do that. You can say bind this the the, the runtime of the service to specific hardware or whatever, and that will be shut down and uh, started and shut down in the right moments. Um, but by default, we don't do that. Um, the whole idea of socket activation, that you, you first install the socket and eventually a service follows, you can actually actually extend to file systems. Uh, meaning that you can, can mount a file system um, via the, the auto mounter, establish it in everything, and everybody can, 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 can use it or, or, or in, the, in, the, in the past are, are there. But actually, actually the, the backing file system is, is created or is made available much, much later. Um, this, is, this is implemented in systemd, where you basically can have, a, have an auto-mounter, which is similar to a socket in this socket activation case, and which is then um, replaced when somebody access, accesses this, this autofs mount point by the real file system. Um, we actually use this by default on systemd installations. We use it for all these kind of, of exotic file systems, um, virtual file systems that most distributions tend to, to compile, but not always load. Like, for example, bin format misc. Bin format misc is a kernel module, um, and it, it, you configure it. It's, it's, it's something weird so that you can execute Java binaries as if they were Linux binaries, basically, and, and mono binaries, too. Um, so bin format misc is a, is, a, is a kernel module. Normally, it's not used unless you install mono or something like that. Um, and it's, it's, it's the configuration happens via a file system that is mounted to proc, uh, sys, fs, bin format misc or something like that. In systemd, nowadays, um, we by default auto mount, uh, put an auto mount point to that directory. And at the moment when an application actually uses it, we will, we will uh, mount the actual file system and that will pull in the kernel module to actually back this. 
The effect of this is that, that all those init scripts that previously did like modprep bin format misc and then actually configure something, they don't have to do that anymore because they can just access bin format misc and the configuration um, just like that because it's always there. So, so the one entry point for this, this thing is the pass and the file um, system hierarchy and, and nothing else anymore. We do this not only for bin format misc, we also do that for a couple of other things. Like um, sysfs security and sysfs um, debug and stuff like that. That's another question. But this can also be used for, for any kinds of directories, by the way. Sorry, stupid question. Does this also does this apply to real file systems as well? What was the question? Sorry. Does this apply to real file systems, e.g., you know, an X3 or an NFS or something like that? Um, but uh, I didn't oh, understand. Sorry. Does it part. apply to? Uh, so you, you can do you can effectively you're replacing auto mount, but can you can you use it for? Well, we we are um, I mean there, there have always been um, auto mount demons. Um, we only implement the subset of that. We only uh, implement direct mounts. You can use it for everything you want. You can back it with an NFS file system or, or whatever. The idea of this is also that that if you if you boot up with multiple file systems like slash home and a separate partition, you can actually run fs check at a point in time where you already boot up the, 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 the further system um, by simply, let's say in the, in, the, in, the, in the slash home case where you have slash home and a separate file system, you could say, okay, I, I install my auto mount point to slash home, continue booting, and then Samba and GDM and whatever else wants to access to slash home will just see the auto mount point. If they access it, they will sleep until it's backed. At the same time, the FS check for the slash home will all, uh, still be running and then eventually when that's finished, it will be, be the real file system will be p pulled in there and stuff like that. So um, it's also, or and that's what actually the slide uh, focuses on, it parallelizes boot up. You can, you can basically continue booting, um, pretending you already had mounted all the file systems that are needed for the boot, while you actually haven't, while the FS check is actually still there, uh, still still um, on the fly, or while you're still working, working, waiting for the really slow NFS server that you have on the internet, um, and it will just work. So um, it's of course kind of surprising that this init system nowadays has, a, has a, an auto mount implementation in it, but it makes a lot of sense, because you actually can, can really boot everything in parallel and you can and can extend this kind of activation, this parallelization that socket bus, uh, socket activation, bus activation allows you to to file system suddenly, and it also simplifies things greatly because because suddenly all those those file systems, all those kernel API file systems, are just established, and and just then, so if somebody wants to use them, he can use them. The kernel modules are not automatically loaded; they're only lo loaded when somebody uses it. But yeah, so so much about. Um, um, file systems. How much time do I have left? Uh, down to 13 minutes. 13 minutes. Well, okay. Um, in systemd, we try to avoid shells, um, shell scripting. Um, usually, if, if administrators hear that, they say, oh my god, I love shell. I always learned shell, and that's what I always did. How can you say shell is evil? So, we say shell is evil because it's just evil. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazingly slow because what it basically does is for every single operation you do, you spawn a process. For example, you copy file from this place to that place. You fork a process called CP. Um, and, and if you look at the usual shell scripts, they use all kinds of stuff. They, they use AWK, they use Perl, they use what kind of thing? They create big, big pipelines. Every, every single part of that is, is usually forking a process. And forking process is, is, is the Linux faster than any other operating systems, but it's still awfully slow, especially if all you do is, is grab for, for a text with said or whatever. Um, so our intention with systemd is to get rid of the shell scripting. It's not, it's not getting rid of the shell. The shell is always going to be part of, of what Linux is. It's more about de-emphasizing it from the boot, so that um, currently every single thing that is started during boot is done via a shell script, basically. Um, you start services with, with, with a shell script um, traditionally. You, 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 you set the host name with a shell script and all these kinds of things. And we looked at that and said, well, if there's so much shell, shell involved, um, we start a gazillion, gazillion of processes during boot. And that's actually the case in, in, in Fedora 14 or something like that. After you boot it up, and uh, uh, when you then open the, the terminal, the first terminal you can, type, uh, can open, and you type echo dollar dollar, which basically tells you what is the current PID of the shell. 
and because the shell that you started there was probably the last process that was started, it's kind of an indication how many processes get, get, got spawned during boot up. Um, traditionally, it was something, I don't know, 2,500 or something like that. And on some distributions, even worse. Um, for example, in, 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 in SU, the, they, they used to do a lot of shells scripting for the weirdest thing and the, the number got even bigger. Nowadays, with systemd, we are, we, are, we are down to something like 500 or, or even lower than that, of which 200 or something are kernel threads. But um, this, while, while removing one process from the boot doesn't, doesn't make much difference, making them all go away um, is quite a difference. So in a, in a, in a modern systemd boot, we actually managed to remove the entire use of shell from the entire boot process. It's all um, gone now. Now the question is, of course, what happened to all the shell scripts? How, how can we get, get, get rid of them? I mean, there was so, so much shell code in, involved into booting. How, how, how can we do that? And we looked at the individual problems. And then, then for example, you look at, the, at, the, at the, the shell scripts that usually are a systemd init script. And you notice that most of it is just a copy of, of something, of, of the skeleton LSB script. And has a shitload of, it, it's really long. Um, it's really long, and it's doing basically nothing. It's always doing the same thing. And basically, um, this is just a switch, um, loads a configuration file first, that sets a couple of environment variables first, blah, blah, blah. Then it's a switch, um, checks a couple, compares a couple of, of, of verbs and stuff like that. And you look at that and say, well, it's always the same thing. So as a programmer, I probably should just write one place for it and never have to, to, to copy that. Into, into a couple of uh, additional shell scripts. And that's basically what we did. We, um, in systemd, services are not started via shell scripts, they are started via simple, any file-like service files. And, and in the ideal case, you basically just need to write um, two lines. One is bracket um, service, the other one is exec start, and you pass the, uh, pass, um, the uh, configure the, uh, the pass that is actually um, spawned. And that's basically it. You can configure a lot of other stuff, but you don't have to. But um, yeah, that's, that's basically how we managed to, to get rid of all the shell scripts. A couple of things are still there that are shell scripts and are probably going to stay in the shell script for quite a while. For example, the, the NFS user space is a, is a horrible mess of shell scripts. It uses so many shell scripts. So if you use NFS, you'll probably continue to using them. But uh, yeah, if you don't use that, you get boot times from about four seconds or something like that um, on, on a modern system D system. Um, yeah, it's one of the, of the designs we had in mind when we did systemd, and we came actually very far with that. Of course, the boot is not just systemd unit scripts, it's also a lot of other stuff. Um, for example, the host name is, is traditionally configured via shell script. We looked at all these things and tried to find better places where these things like configuring host name can be implemented in C, where, where it might make sense to move it instead. And, and for example, the host name is now configured in systemd from PID1 as one of the first things when it boots up. So basically, before the first process starts, we already have sets of host names. And there's a lot of other stuff, like, like mod probe and, and all these kind of things. And we always try to find better places to do that. For, for very often, for example, for, for many system V services, the, the shell scripts before them remove PID files and stuff like that. And we thought, well, isn't, wouldn't it be much nicer if the, if the, if the demo itself would be able to remove the PID file if, it, if there is a leftover PID file from before? And we patched all this kind of stuff. and to the effect that nowadays um, there's no shell involved in all anymore in this stuff. And in something we moved into the kernel, something we moved into UDEF. Um, a very often heard, um, and I'm surprised that nobody is complaining about that uh, here yet, um, very uh, uh, often heard complain about this thing that we removed the shell from the standard boot, is that shell is something I know as an administrator, and I use it for debugging. I just put an, a set dash x or something in there and I see what actually happens. And that's a valid argument, but we say that shell is not a debugger. Shell, shell is a shell. Shell is a sh something for, for scripting execution of their processes. If you want debugging, then use proper debugging facilities. And we hence try to provide a couple of them for systemd. For example, we have relative elaborate um, tracing. You can, you can just enable them during boot and you get long, long output what actually is happening. We provide you with graphical tools even where you can, can, can graph all the dependencies between the services. You can get an interactive boot up where you get a, a question basically for every service that is spawned if you actually really want to do that. So we try to look at all these, these, the, the, these claimed issues that, that's really hard to debug and actually thought, okay, is this what you want to do? Then we'll add a proper debug facility for you and not this, this the shells thing which is not a debugger but you think that is a debugger. So, yeah. 
among other things, systemd is, I mean, one of the most foremost things it's supposed to do is supervise services, supervise processes. So, one thing you want to do with systemd is make it the best process babysitter um, thinkable. Um, for this, we use something called control groups. Control groups are short C groups as a kernel feature in Linux. Has been there for quite a while, but usually it was under the radar of most of the people. Um, we use it to actually um, supervise services. So what, what, what are control groups? Control groups are basically something where you can group processes into a hierarchical tree. Um, and these groups can be labeled because they're basically just you mount, you mount a special file system, the C group FS, and then by MKDR, MKDR, you create a group, and by echo PID into a special file in that directory, you can add a process to a group, and stuff like that. The, the original intention of, of, of C groups was to, to make it possible to, to, apply, to apply special rules, um, special resource limits, and, and, and similar, similar things to, to a set of processes. The idea is to to, to the, the background was originally something like containers. So you had a couple of containers running in your system and you wanted to say, this container of this customer can use so much memory and this other container of the other customer can use um, this much disk space or whatever. Well, actually not disk space, but let's say CPUs. Um, however, control groups are completely abstract. They, they exist in the kernel without actually having to have any kind of resource limitation or anything applied to them, um, which is really useful for us because we can use them to name processes. The nice effect of this is if, if a process that's a member of a C group uh, forks and forks a couple of children, all these children will be member of the same C group and they will still be labeled. This enables um, to do us a lot of amazing things. For example, if you, if you have Apache, and Apache spawns a shitload of uh, CGI scripts, they will all be part of the same uh, original Apache C group, and we can actually trace them back. Which is actually a real problem with classic Unix systems. Because on classic Unix systems, if you start Apache, and a CGI script of your customers, whatever, um, spawns a, a forks a couple of times, and then the, 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 ch the, the middle children die, and they rename themselves and stuff like that, and you have a really hard time figuring out Oh, did this process actually originally belong to Apache? Did it get started by Apache? And in systemd, all, this pro all these problems go away because we start Apache in its own C group. All these CGI scripts are, are children of that C group. If you type ps um, with some weird parameters, slash uh, dash eo c groups pid whatever, then you can actually see that because, because the kernel will maintain this information that this process originally belongs to Apache um, for all the children created. It also allows us to, us to really do fancy things like, like for the first time, systemd actually allows you to, to kill services properly. Because, I mean, most administrators would probably say, yeah, if I wanted to kill a service, I, and let's say it's cron, then I type kill all cron. And then some of you will probably notice, hmm, it's probably not the, the best way to do, because if some user accidentally called this process cron, then it's going to be gone as well. So, kill all is not the nice thing. Then they say, okay, then, then I read the PID file and use that. But that's still not very, very um, correct because, um, because uh, um, you suddenly have the problem, like, again, with Apache, that, that there might be gazillions of CGI scripts spawn and you can't kill them. However, the control group stuff of the kernel actually gives us for the first time the power that we can kill every single member of that C group and we kill, can kill them as long as there are members and then eventually they're gone. So, I can probably talk for hours and I have uh, a shitload of additional slides for that, but we probably can, should come to an end here and if we still have room for a couple of questions, then um, please ask them now or even later. Yeah, you said with uh, systemd we can start a lot of stuff, but you didn't say how we can stop them or how we can check a status because you said there is no more in these scripts, so how um, do we do that? So, so there, um, for example, there, there are very ma many ways how you can actually supervise processes with systemd. For example, one simple thing is you can actually use ps. Because as mentioned, ps-eo, for example, will actually show you to which service it belongs. So if you want to know if P Apache is still running or if there's anything of Apache left, you can use uh, just ps. However, we also, of course, provide our own tools. Like um, the most important tool with systemd is called system control. You can type system control status apache.service, which basically means give me the information about Apache, and then we'll tell you, is it running? Is it currently in the process of being started? Is it stopped? Um, what are the processes 
that belong to Apache, which is the main process. Um, it will also give you a lot of information that was previously not available. For example, um, systemd records if, if a process dies, if Apache dies, what the exit code was it died with, which is something that's completely lost right now. If Apache, for example, is act false, traditionally on Unix, nobody would ever notice that. It would just go away. The, the init system would eat up this, the, the return value, and then, then that's it. And, and systemd, this would be, sp is actually always um, stored along with the service information. And if you type system control status, you can, can, can see it, and you see the exit code and everything. And you, um, eventually, we probably want to link that up, by the way, to a board like this, the crash report system we have in, on Fedora. And then you can actually just click on it if you see it's crashed, and it will get you even further than that. We can do one last question. This will have to be the last one. So this sounds great. Uh, probably not everyone seems to agree. Devin has one, Ubuntu has another one, this is the third one. I don't really care who was first, it's not important. But the point is there, the data scripts are going to be written in different ways for different distros. So, so what's the solution to this? The solution is that um, the way things look like right now for systemd, um, everything is very, very bright. And with the exception for Ubuntu, we already have convinced right now every, every major distribution. Um, so Fedora is going to, ch to, to switch with Fedora 15. OpenSUSE is probably one, one iteration later. They already have it in the distribution. Mandriva has announced it um, a couple of weeks back that they're doing the switch for the next release. Uh, Migo has decided that in, the, in, in, in their discussion that they um, are going to switch. Um, it's already in Debian. It's in Gentoo. They have difficulties adopting it as, as default because they have huge development cycles. Um, but it's a, it is in all of the distributions, and all the, the distributions that are capable of making decisions have decided to go for systemd. The exception is Upstart, um, which is still going to be used on, 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 on Ubuntu for a while. Um, well, I'm not going to discuss this here in public too much, but uh, we have hope that's going to change eventually too. Um, Scott Remnant, who was a canonical employee who created Upstart, recently left the company and went to Google. He still... Um, claims that he wa wants to push that in, in, in Ubuntu. But we actually made quite inroads into Ubuntu to convince him to go to go system D as well. At this point of time, system D does everything that Upstart does, and a shitload of, of additional stuff. So um, the, the, the only reason why they're still staying with Upstart is basically because they have invested a shitload of, of, of time into it, and they just don't want to get rid of it right away. But um, I don't think, I mean, given that, that Canonical is not really into doing too much development, they basically just take what the other people do for them, um, I think eventually um, they will notice that it's not, it's not worth it trying to, to continue with Upstart and always trying to keep up with it. Because right now we are leading and they are following. So yeah, and, they, and I don't expect them to, to switch in the next year or something, but I'm, the way I see it, I kind of assume that in a year or so, like, and then the version that comes then, they will do the switch. Thank you very much, guess. Leonard. And put your hands together for him. That was an excellent talk. Thank you. For those of you not aware, um, he also plays around a lot with Pulse Audio, and he'd probably love to talk to you about that too. <laughs> so in the meantime, there's a nice little husk bowl for you to you. put your little trinkets in, in appreciation from, from us. Thank